a generation to go by for you. You know, you remember every aspect of it. Uh, you know, there's, you meet people, have events, it just seems full and rich, like a child experiencing summer. It yeah. just goes on and on and on. Um, and then suddenly you can have a moment where a year goes by in the snap of a finger. Um, and, and both of those things are happening simultaneously, both in our experience and around us. Um, so you know, that, that, that's just sort of a part, I guess, of the structural reality of time that the count is grappling with. But, but then, of course, it is, as you say, it's heightened by two things, by, by the fact that the book is really about sort of uh, a moment in time, you know, it kind of begins in a moment in time where an entire 100-year-plus history, uh, an experience of a country, a set of values, a culture is being set aside and the next 100 years is being launched. Um, and so you have, uh, you know, as you, as you say, you're dragging sort of nostalgia for that, the, the past century, and you're, you're dealing with the rapidly changing events of this new century that's being created around you. And the hotel kind of creates, is an oasis, so that, yeah. so that, that, that those dynamics can be investigated or considered with a little bit more, um, with, without it just being an overwhelming, uh, you know, experience of, you know, raw uh, front lines revolution. And, you know, um, sorry, before I move on to the next question, could we record this conversation? Is that all right with you? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, thanks. So I think, yeah, somebody's on it. So the second question is that this book, for all practical purposes, seems like historical fiction, though I hate to call it that, really. To me, I think it goes beyond that. Uh, because I wasn't as much invested in the history, of course, though it shaped the characters lives and the counts specifically yeah. uh, which you established right at the beginning of the book uh, but you know it just sort of seemed that history was just as sort of like a catalyst to move their lives ahead and what happens thereof to them yeah. so how easy or difficult was it for you to embed history in and it's a big book it's about 462 pages long you know and and then to ensure that while all that has been played out and, and you spring instances on the reader, right? For, for instance, one character enters, a character sort of leaves abruptly. And after like say 40 pages, that character who has left is back again. So how do you then enmesh history with the coming, the going, and as I said, you know, time passing, like in 20 pages, a year or two years, or maybe even five years have passed by. Yeah. You know, almost like Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, where, where there's a major section where about 10 years pass by. Yeah. So how, how, do you, how did you deal with that? In, and in the sense, also your research then about Russia. And okay. I believe you stayed at the hotel for, for some time. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. So, talk so to I'm, us about that? Yeah. Let me, let me uh, I'm going to take, I'm, I'm unpack that. I'm going to talk to you about yeah, yeah. time. I'm, we're going to sure. go back to the t time thing for a second, and then I'll talk to you about the historical Sure. Sure. Context. Sure. Um, <laughs> The, the, your listeners, you should, should know, I mean, you may find it interesting uh, to learn this. If you didn't know it, I, I would hope that you did not notice what I'm about to say, but, um, but I, I, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, describe it nonetheless. The book is structured in a little bit unusual way in that it begins with the count being sentenced to house arrest. And then the, and he's marched through the hotels of the, ho the doors of the hotel on you know, page one, basically. The book then tells you what happens to the count one day later, two days later, five days later, 10 days later, uh, three weeks later, six weeks later, three months later, six months later, one year later to the day. And then it's two years to the day, four years to the day, eight years to the day, 16 years later to the day from his entry into the hotel. And at that point, uh, the midpoint of, of, of the structure, it reverses. And from there, you learn what happened eight years from that point, then four years from then, then two years and one year, six months, three months, six weeks, three weeks, 10 days, five days, two days, one day, until the final page. So the whole book is structured in this sort of symmetrical accordion. And, and, um, and you know, why did I do that? You know, when I came, decided to write this book and I decided I was gonna tell the story of this count trapped in the hotel, I immediately decided that I was gonna use this structure to tell the story. It was, uh, I've been writing fiction since I was a kid. Many years ago, I was like, oh, it'd kind of be interesting to tell a story with 
this kind of accordion leaping structure, this doubling cycle, and, uh, and then the sort of re retreat again. And um, as soon as I came up with the idea of telling the story of the Count in the hotel in Moscow, I thought, oh, that's perfect. That's, that should be the structure that tells the story. Now, you know, why, why did I, why was my instinct so strong about that? And, and it goes back to some of the things we've already been talking about. I, I, I'm, I wanted the story to span a significant period of time. I wanted the reader to be able to go through the changes in the Count's life, in his state of mind, in the evolution of his relationships, and of course, as the world outside the doors is evolving. You know, this is all part of, of the, the, game, the, the goal. But if you said, well, you can write every day between, or that 30 year time frame, it, you know, it would drive, I would collapse as a writer, you would collapse as a reader. So you need to find some way to incorporate this incredibly uh, uh, event filled span of time um, and deliver for the reader that feeling of time passing, deliver the experience of the issues, deliver the development of the relationships, the change in sentiments, um, and within the historical context, but not for it to be this open-ended, never-ending, <laughs> you know, saga. And, and so I use the time structure as a way to achieve that. Now, I, it also allows me to, to cheat a little. So, for instance, when I first designed the book, uh, in that first few, first day, I originally thought, oh yeah, okay, I'll start in 1920. That'll be a nice starting point, and it'll end in 1952. And when I laid it out in the way I described to you, what ends up happening is that lands, you know, just past the midpoint, you land in 1944. That's the year that shows up if you start 1920 and use that doubling cycle. Now that's problematic um, for me as a writer in that that means you're right in the thick of the Second World War. And my concern was that while I want the readers to remember that the war was one of the many things that played out over this three decades of, of Stalinist rule. Um, and it was incredibly, you know, turbulent and, and, and uh, damaging to uh, Russian civilian life. It would be a novel in itself to try to tell what happened in 1944 in Moscow. Um, so I, I get to use that sort of leaping structure to sort of shift it two years forward and I land in 1946 instead. And as a result, since you go from 38 to 46, the war has happened, and I'm not going to describe it to you in more than, you know, two pages of summary. Yeah, and, and, you, and you haven't. And for me, that was, in a way, extremely refreshing. Uh, yeah. Because I was kind of dreading at that point <laughs> that you will talk about it. I'll be very honest. And sure. I was like, I hope he doesn't talk about it. Yes. Uh, and you didn't. In fact, you used a very, very, um, uh, very heartwarming uh, character in, 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 in the, you know, as Count's friend, Mishka, is it yes. Mishka? Yes. Who, who does this wonderful thing of, of you know, he, the book that he gives the Count at the end. Uh, so, sorry, guys. I mean, if it's a spoiler, I think you should just uh, drop out of the conversation. But, but really, it's not. And you use bread as such a beautiful uh, method to convey what, what you have to through literature. Uh, and, and I see that literature, and sorry for my rambling question, just bear with me, please. And I see literature being such a central focus to the book, uh, right from the Russian greats to Socrates to, to, to you know, talking about a Montaigne, and, and then you move on and you use literature also in such a wonderful way to talk about the Count's consciousness uh, and, and art. Uh, you know, when they're watching movies and then you've changed the characters uh, to make them sound Russian as, as two people would uh, perhaps uh, who are Russian and discussing these American films. How did that come about? Because, you know, for a reader then, because I was making a note of all the times books and authors were mentioned in, the, in, 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 in A Gentleman in Moscow. And to me, that was extremely fascinating that, that how you use that to move the story or, or, or narrative forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, so as, an, as a writer, does, do you already think of all of this? I mean, this is the way you're going to structure the book. I'm going to introduce this, or just does it come about as you're writing the book? It's a mix. I'm an outliner. Uh, so I, I design every chapter uh, in the book before I start writing chapter one. I know every chapter, what's going to happen in it, where it's going to take place, what the setting is like. I know the characters and their backgrounds. 
in a particular chapter, I know the key events, some of the conversations, some of the feelings that are going to be sort of hit in this sort of evolution of, of emotions in the book. So I know a lot. Now, when you sit down and write the chapter, um, there's a lot of discovery. And in fact, this sounds a little paradoxical, but I do the outlining because when I'm writing the chapter, I don't want to be thinking about those things. Instead, I'd like to free my subconscious to, to bring the events to life poetically. And, uh, and, and so I have sort of more liberty in letting so, the art of the craft express itself in a chapter if I'm not worrying about, you know, what, what's happening next, you know? So, so I sort of use the outline to allow a sort of more artistic exploration within the bounds of a single chapter or scene or event. Um, I, you know, I, I think your, your description is a good one of, of, of Mishka and, and of the, you know, of, of the various roles of, of literature of, uh, over the course of the book, of music, of, of movies. Um, I, I kind of knew early on, in the American tradition, I don't know the Indus, in Indian literature well enough to know, but, it, but in the American tradition and the Russian tradition too, that there are examples of terrific uh, stripped down writing styles. You know, in, in English, in American, you know, obviously Ernest Hemingway or, or you know, more recently Raymond Carver would be examples of this, Chekhov in Russia. Minimalist style of, of storytelling and of expression. And when I set out to write a gentleman in Moscow, I knew from the beginning it was not going to be minimalist. It was going to be maximalist. You know, here was a, a 19th century figure who's educated in culture and kind of a, and loves it and, and, and is exposed to, to music, to literature, is, is in a historical time. Um, is, is interested in cuisine. So I knew that all these various elements were gonna have to come into the book in some way to fully express who he was and, uh, and how he was evolving. Um, now, now, when you, so, so I wanna say two things about kind of the references that made, and then I'll shift to the, the movie question that you're asking. Sure. One is, 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 you know, sometimes I think maybe I overdo it a little, you know, <laughs> but, but the, the, the thing that if, I, what if, I, if I sit back and I ask myself, I go to a dinner party with, you know, my wife and I go to a dinner party with 10 other friends. There's 12 of us at the table. You have drinks, you have dinner, you say goodnight, you go home. If you looked at what gets discussed in that three hour period, you know, without question, you know, someone will say, what are you reading? And that will get discussed. Or if a book is currently of significance in the, in the, in the dialogue, it will get discussed. People, you know, you know, you're talking about, have you seen Breaking Bad? You know, you, you, and you discuss that, you know, and, uh, of course, you have the, the, the events in the newspaper. You know, they're going to be a part of it. So, so I think it is very natural in, in part of contemporary life that when you gather together and you're interacting, that the sort of the threads of the cultural experience that you're having are a part of the active conversation that you're in. Um, and so, so it's very natural for me to have that happen in, in the case of the narrative. Um, now, the, the, the plus for me is that I think of... You know, the, if you try, if you ask yourself, what is the novel? What can it do? Uh, what makes a novel if, in a, as effective at the height of its form? And uh, you know, I would answer that by saying, you know, the thing, extraordinary thing about a novel is that it is a um, it is a fixed object. I mean, literally, you know, as a book, it's it's got fixed dimensions. It's got a fixed number of words in it, and yet, a well written novel, well crafted, well imagined can be read decade after decade by people of different gender, or different ages, or different social classes. Those people can be engaged and entertained by that literature, and they can walk away with very different views about what it might mean to them. Now, in addition, a well-written, a truly well-written novel, a classic, can be read by you at the age of 20, 40, and 60, and you will enjoy it each time in a different way to some degree, and you will draw different conclusions about what it means to you at 20, 40, and 60 as your own life evolves. Now, how does this happen? How's a, how does this book with this fixed number of words that potentially was written 100 years ago, 150 years ago, have the capacity to engage all these different types of people and mean different things, even to the same person over time? And, and I think that's really related to the fact that the book, a, book, a well-crafted novel is bringing in, it's not trying to tell a point. It's trying to create in a, a, an environment where there are images, there are illusions, there are sentiments and ideas that are expressed, there are uh, visual you know, stimuli, all of these elements which are working together in some kind of mysterious harmony um, that the author doesn't have full control over. Um, and, and it creates all kinds of resonance so that 
that, you know, a passage or an image on, in the first chapter can suddenly ring, you know, a bell when you're reading the book later and, and suddenly it's these two things that somehow resonate and then that ties to something that a character said and something that befell a third character, etc. And all this sort of starts to create meaning for us. But there's so many components and there's it's so organically created that there's sort of an infinite number of combinations that can come out of that process. So uh, illusion, as we're talking about, whether it's you know, referencing a novel, referencing a piece of music, referencing a movie, one of the advantages that gives me in striving towards that goal is that it's like you, you put in reference to uh, Montaigne and a few discussions of his essays, and it's like a door in the narrative. Behind that door is all of Montaigne's thought and his approach to, uh, to life and, uh, you know, and, and, a, and a sense of the age of enlightenment and all those things come you know, sort of shining through the door uh, when you make that reference. And so, so it's, it's expanding the power of meaning within the fixed context of the story. Now, um, you know, the movies. So yes, uh, American movies become a center point later in the story. Um, and I, I'd say that one thing that's interesting, most Americans wouldn't know this, uh, is that American movies were very popular during the, uh, particularly during the early part of the communist era in Russia. Uh, during the Soviet era, the Russians were big fans of uh, the Marx Brothers. They were big fans of uh, Charlie Chaplin. Um, uh, Stalin was a big fan of the American Western, who would force his, his, the members of you know, pull up beer, they'd come to his house for dinner, dinner would be served at 11, and at two in the morning, he'd make them watch a movie. You know, everybody trying to keep themselves up so they don't disappoint the boss. Um, but, but so American movies are very much a part of, uh, in this interesting way, a contained part of Russian life during the Stalinist period. And so I knew that, that the, there was gonna be a Politburo figure, a Kremlinite, who was gonna approach the Count and ask the Count to share with him insights into the West, covertly. Um, so that he could become uh, more intelligent, but wouldn't want anybody to know he's gathering this kind of information. He's going to meet with the Count, and that eventually what they do is they use movies to, to have that conversation. You know, so I thought that'd be a, a fun, sort of fascinating <clears throat> setup. Um, pretty early on, I thought that Bogart, a Bogart film would be the a major, would be the turning point. And in the first draft, it was Maltese Falcon. And, uh, you know, I wrote the first draft. I tend to write the draft alone. I don't share it with anybody. When I'm done with the first draft, I start to share it with a few people to gather some input and rethink the book and uh, to start the revision process. And when I was going through that, the, the Maltese Falcon stuff just wasn't working. I'd written a lot about it. Um, it was kind of in there uh, and, and over multiple chapters. And um, it just wasn't working. And so you kind of retreat and ask yourself, all right, this isn't working. Do I rewrite it? Do I pull the whole thing? Is there a variation that I should be considering which somehow would work more effectively? Um, and you, I struggled, I, I tried doing different things and they just weren't working. And then suddenly it's like one day you're on the treadmill or whatever and you're like, oh my God, what was I thinking? It's Casablanca, of course. That's what they should have been watching. That's what, that's what they should be discussing. Because as most of you know, I assume, because most of us have seen Casablanca, you know, as adult you know, at some point. But you know, the nature of the of the story of Casablanca is that it's in the middle of the turbulent time of the Second World War, but it's at the fringe of events. You know, because it's in Casablanca, it's not in the heart of the European uh, theater of battle. Um, and you've got a, t a city which has received people from around the Europe who are fleeing in the hopes of, of escaping the war. So you've kind of got the war. You've got, you know, Morocco, you've got Casablanca as this little sort of inside place where all this uh, people are gathering and you've got elements of the, the German military, elements of the French Vichy, you know, you've got spies, you've got all that going on, but then you've got, you know, uh, refugees. Within the middle of Casablanca, you've got Rick's Cafe and Rick's Cafe is an oasis. That's what it is. I mean, when you go through the doors, there's gambling, there's music, there's food, you know, there's, and there's all of the things that you'd expect. There's a little bit of romance, there's fear, there's hope, you know, there's theft. It's all happening kind of in this oasis. And so, as I said, the minute I thought of Casablanca, I said, like, oh, this is perfect. Because of course, that's what the metropole was in reality in yeah. Soviet Russia. You know, it, it is, it's a real hotel. It was built in 1905. And uh, initially, the Soviets turned it into a, bu a bureaucratic building. 
were in the early stages of that post-revolution, they were going to use it as literally as an office building. But what happened is as, as ambassadors began showing up in Russia after the, after the Civil War, and trade representatives began showing up, corporate executives began showing up, the, the Bolsheviks, the Soviets realized, we need to have a nice hotel for these people. Otherwise, they'll think that communism is failing. So they literally restored sort of the glamour of the Metropole Hotel on purpose. They, they put a doorman in front, they had bellhops, champagne and caviar in the restaurant, American jazz in the bar, as, you know, in the 19, as early as in the 1920s, in order to, to make foreign sophisticated visitors feel like, like things were going well in Russia, sort of the notion. So it was literally this kind of like Rick's Cafe, amongst all the swirling dangers, disruptions, you know, shortages, uh, uh, controlled freedoms, controlled speech and art, you had this place in the middle that where things were happening. And, you know, uh, then there is the question of when I was looking at how you begin your chapters, which I thought was extremely unusual. And, and I love the way uh, you title them. It's yes. almost like you've taken these words from the dictionary that begin with the, the letter A. And, yes. you know, in a certain very organized and, 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 you know, sort of thought of manner, you start, you know, so it's, it's almost like you reach the middle of the book and then you sort of work it out yourself in a way, or you try to as a reader that, you know, what could come next. Yeah, yeah, but of right. course, as a reader, you can't even tell what comes next. And that's the beauty of this book in so many ways. And so, so how, again, you know, I'm fascinated when, when writers do some. And you've done a lot of these things in the course of this one massive book. Uh, I mean, we could go on and on talking about A Gentleman in Moscow because that's the beauty of this novel. Uh, so I, would just, I just want to know, how did that come to you? Was Again, is everything that structured when you start writing a book or do things just pop at you like Casablanca, right? On a treadmill or right. things like that. You know? So how did that idea come to you for, for titling the chapters a certain way? Um, you know, and, and for those who haven't noticed, because some people don't notice, all of the chapter titles, even if, they're, it's, a, if it's a four-word title, every word in every chapter title is an A word. Um, and so, so pretty early on, you know, maybe it's the kind of thing, like maybe I was crafting, it, so it was not a plan, let's put it this way, it was, it was not in the outline, I know, I'm going to do this. Um, I think as a younger person, as a younger writer, at one point I was sort of interested in all the interesting words that begin with A. So, you know, archaeology and anthropology and architecture. And, you know, I was, I was like, oh, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing. And, and I think I had a notion at one point that there would be a story where a book where, where you know, it would be these one word monolithic A words that were kind of somehow metaphorically tied to the events of the characters. So I got stashed away. I didn't ever do that. But so, so then as I was writing this, I, I think that, that there was an A word maybe in chapter one and an A word in chapter three. And in chapter five, I was suddenly like, wait, you know, maybe this is, maybe that's what I'm going to do here. And, and, and I, you kind of take a step back and you have to check your instincts. You know, does that make sense to, to this? Is that going to be, is it going to be uh, disruptive? Is it going to be off-putting? Is it going to, you know, somehow undermine the, under, undermine the, um, the tenor or the, the, uh, uh, that the story is, is telling it. And, and you have to kind of feel through that. And my instincts were, no, no, this is a good idea. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go with it. And you can always pull it out later if you, if you change course. But, but, but I, and I, and I, as I kept doing it, I, I, came, I gained in confidence that it was the right thing to do. Now, upon reflection, why do I think it was the right thing to do? I, you know, because I don't, I wasn't 100% sure when I started. But I, is that I think that, um, it's kind of related to a big challenge in the book. I knew going into the, telling the story that the, my biggest challenge was trying to tell the, do justice to the story of the Count, his personality, uh, his events, the way he sees things, his optimism, uh, you know, to tell this humane story about this one individual who's in a, in a, in a special circumstance with some luxury around him but yet to do some justice to how challenging life was in the Stalinist era. Because I'm, I'm not telling the Gulag archipelago. Yes. And I, so I knew that, how do, you, how do you manage these two things? What is the right balance? Is, you know, if I am not going to tell the story of you know, the, the starvation in uh, Stalingrad during the siege, I'm not going to tell about, you know, in great detail about the, you know, the, 
terrible experience of people in the gulags. You know, that, that's not what this book is about, but yet to ignore it is not correct either. You know, it need, the book needs to, to incorporate those events in some way to, to pay uh, heed to them because it's, it's a part of, of understanding the Count's story and the story of Russia at that time. So, so, so as I said, this was to me was the biggest challenge was how do you do these two things and bring them together? And after uh, much, part of it was this breaking up the time sequence so that I could, I, I wouldn't have to like land in the middle of the worst times. I could kind of choose how they're covered. A major help for me was, was coming up with the notion of the footnotes. You know, and yes, of course, I would want to talk about that next. Please continue, yeah. please. Yeah, so, so you know, the footnotes are, they're, they're not, the most 90% of the book is told from the Count's perspective. It's his tone of voice, his sense of optimism, his sort of quirks, his cultural background. But about 10% of the book, or 15, is told from a very different perspective. It shows up in the footnotes first, and it's a person who we can tell is more cynical than the Count, is more experiencing the, the, the challenges of Russian life more directly. You know, he's more jaded. And, and so, you know, he's inter interrupting occasionally, say, well, you know, that's what the Count's thinking, but what's going on elsewhere is X. You know, kind of as a reminder of, yeah, yeah, right. That's, you know, to us as readers, these things are happening at the same time. And um, uh, the addendums, you know, in the book were introduced to play that role. These sort of little brief things at the end of chapters where we follow Nina into the countryside or Andre home after he's lost his son in the Second World War. So again, we can get a feel for the events in the bigger sense without them totally throwing off the, the, the Count's story as it needs to be told. Um, so, so the reason I say all this is that one of the ways I tried to manage this is as I felt that it was very natural for the story to have a little bit of magic to it. Um, so there are elements of magic, whether it's, you know, bees who can fly 300 miles or 400 miles and understand, you know, can a human speech, you know, or there's, you know, the ghost of a one-eyed cat showing up later. And, you know, so there, there is, so I wanted there to be a little bit of an element of magic. as a, a little bit of magical realism, I guess you could call it. Um, yeah. And to, you know, which I know is like uh, the India writing, you know, there's a tradition of, of there in Indian writing, much as there is in Latin American writing. And, and I, I wanted uh, a sense of that magical realism, partly as a signal to the reader that, Early on, don't, don't expect that this is gonna be a retelling of the Gulag Archipelago. It's not what it is. And, and to give the sort of permission to the reader to go into the story, into the Count's world um, in a slightly different frame of mind. And so I lay all that out because I felt that by, by playing this game in the chapter titles where all the words are letter A's, it's another way of, of trying to send that signal to the reader. That this is yes, not so bringing the magic, sorry. Yes, it's, there's a little bit of, there's going to be an element of fun here. There's going to be an element of game, gamesmanship. And, and there's going to be a lot of serious stuff too. But, 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 uh, but, uh, but you know, I, I wanted the reader to, to sort of understand the realm that they're entering and to join me there in a particular frame of mind. And, and so things like that are ways of, of trying to achieve that goal. Sure. We have about 10 minutes to go. So I'll be opening the questions to, uh, to the participants. Uh, please type your questions and, and send it to me and we'll ask them all. And yeah. um, so, yeah, I'm just waiting for them. Uh, somebody had asked, uh, are you a PG Wodehouse fan? Because oh. uh, yeah. uh, the person felt there was a lot of Wodehouse influence in the language. You know, it's so funny. Uh -huh. I, I had never read Wodehouse when I wrote the book, but I've read eight Wodehouses since. And so I, a number of people have said that and I totally understand why. Because the sort of the sense of humor in in the counts sort of the aristocratic foibles and the sort of the sense of humor of having the rug pulled out from under him and sort of overblown descriptions that sometimes he'll use are very i think are very uh Wodehousian, i guess you know yeah very worcester-esque or however you want to oh, the barber yeah. shop as well yeah. what happened to him yeah uh, that, that exactly. was very dramatic but but extremely uh extremely funny i thought yeah. at the same time uh, so, yeah. so mamta mangaldas is asking do you have any literary influences and your all-time favorite books. What are your all-time favorite books? I'm 55, and I've been writing fiction and reading since first grade. So I have many, many, many influences. But, and uh, you know, my probably I think my three, my three, the novel, three novels that I admire the most, that I, that I really have loved the most, are uh, *War and Peace* uh, by Tolstoy, 100 Years of Solitude* by Marquez. 
and uh, Moby Dick by Herman Melville and, and, you know, the American. And I guess, you know, one of the things that these three books have in common is they are all quite large in scope. They're ambitious in scope. They cover a meaningful amount of time, an array of characters, and they are bringing together sort of a swirling uh, combination of issues, themes, and sentiments, and, and using different tools to achieve sort of harmony with, that, with all that material. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I find them so impressive in, in, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I certainly would not strive, this, this book is probably the closest, you know, I will try, strive, I'm not saying I'm, I'm at that level, but I'm just saying it's, the, it's a book where it, it like those books, it's gonna try, it tries to incorporate all these various elements. I, my, you know, my next novel will be much simpler in shape and style than A Gentleman in Moscow. Uh, somebody, uh, so Farooq has a question for you, uh, talking about the summer solstice. Yeah. Uh, he says that we know the count is sentenced on 21st June, but yeah. it seems to be more than just his house arrest anniversaries during the course of the narration. Yeah. Is, this, is there more to the summer solstice in, yeah. in the book? So the first thing is, is we go, going back to that thing I said earlier, that the, the chapters are literally occurring like one year later, two years later, four years later, eight years later, 16 years later, et cetera. It means that June 21st is the day, is the, is the actual day of the, of the year that the majority of the chapters take place on. Only in the last six months and the first six months do you see other days. In the middle, it's yeah. always June 21. Now, of course, I could have picked any day of the calendar year. So, yes, you know, I liked the fact that um, that the longest day of the year would kind of be the day, sort of adding to this sort of element that we keep returning <laughs> with the count to the longest day of the year again. You know, but now it's four years later. Now it's eight years later. And uh, and and the, that what that allowed me to do is 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 to also structure the chapters so that there, you know, it's kind of there. It's a day in the life. These chapters, you know. Uh, so, you know, like uh, the Bully of A's chapter, a lot happens in that chapter. Um, it's when Osip first shows up. It's when Anna and the Count are kind of interacting and, uh, you know, and they're scrambling together to make, you know, the Bully of A's in the middle of the night. That all happens in a 24 hour or 16 hour period, basically, um, on June 21st. So, so, so I like that kind of idea that the longest day of the year is kind of where, where we're going to keep returning. Now, I will also point out that this is cheating again, but... I, I did not, I could have picked December 21st, the shortest day of the year, and it would have been a hard book to write and read because it is dark, <laughs> there is, you know, it is snowing, uh, you know, they got four hours of daylight or something like that in Moscow at that time of year. Um, it is overcast, you know, 28 out of 31 days, it snows 28 out of 31 days, it's freezing outside, and I was like, you know, that's a, that's a heavy burden to carry, you know. <laughs> If we're going to be telling a story set in, in Stalinist Russia, at least it can be, you know, spring, you know, for a while we're talking. And there'll be a little bit of winter at the beginning and the end. And so, so yeah, so that was, that's part of it too. So uh, somebody has a very interesting question. Uh, Hani says, is there a vegetarian preparation of the Latvian stew that one could try and probably the wine to go with it? <laughs> so. yeah. I don't think there would be a vegetarian. I, I'm, and I, maybe you could do it with, you know, and I, I don't do very much vegetarian cooking. Um, I suppose, I suppose um, uh, a tofu type, uh, you know, or maybe an egg, you know, type of, of, of protein could step in. But yes, it is a very simple stew to begin with. And the pork is very much at the center of it. So it's hard to pull that out and put something in. But, but, but uh, you know, the the Latvian stew, for those who don't know, uh, I mean, it appears early in the book, you know, on the in the Advent chapter. It's kind of on Christmas, their Christmas Eve, and the the count observes a young couple ordering it, and then orders it himself. I I, I do cook, make that dish for my family. Uh, if you Google Amor Toll's Latvian stew, you will find the recipe as well as sort of an essay by me about it. And one of the interesting things about that stew is is uh, I, I'm you know really raised in in uh, Western European, the tradition of Western European cooking, French cooking, Italian cooking, as you might imagine. Uh, if you're eating, you know, if you're uh, sort of an ambitious cook in America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, that's where you were turning. Now, today, we all are cooking Asian food and Mexican food and Latin food as well. But, but let's say I was raised, you know, where in New York City, the finer restaurants were all Italian, French, and that kind of thing when I was young. Um, and, and so uh, if you make stews in uh, you know, in the Italian tradition, the French tradition, um, what the Latvian stew is very, very different from those Southern European stews is that it is made without broth, 
It's made with water instead of a broth. There are no fresh herbs in it. You know, whereas in a you know, fr French or Italian soup, they would be jam packed with herbs and you know, it would be broth based. Um, there's, so like, and there's no wine. You know, so three of the main components to traditional European stew making are not there. And the entire stew is made out of water, dried apricots, dried prunes, pork, uh, a little bit of tomato paste, and then very caramelized onions. And you can see, you can just picture the Russian village in winter where this is a very valuable stew to be able to make because you couldn't, you didn't have those other things. You didn't have the herbs, you didn't have the, you know, readily access to, you know, broth was expensive and difficult, wine was difficult, you know, certainly you didn't have the fresh vegetables. And so, uh, so yeah, with these simple dried components, you could make it all fall in winter. And it has this incredible thing that the, the caramelizing the onions to the, to almost beyond where you'd think gives the stew this incredibly smoky, sweet flavor, which complements with the apricots and prunes. So anyway, more than you wanted to know, um, could you do a vegetarian? I guess so, but yeah, maybe it's the tofu is the strategy. Uh, I think, uh, so we are getting a lot of questions um, and I don't know how much time you have really to I have, take. I have, I have time. Okay, so there's a question on, do you have any update on the mini series uh, that was supposed to be planned? Uh, that was by Patty right at the beginning. She has asked this. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the mini series uh, hit is, is being made, um, hit a, uh, it slowed down. Uh, the, the writer uh, that they had, the, the, the team overseeing it was not, did not like the scripts they were getting. And so they kind of had to start from scratch again. I am currently writing the pilot for them, uh, for that effort. Apple is ultimately going to distribute it, uh, it looks like. You know, that's, that's who our partner is. Um, a British director named Tom Harper is the director and Kenneth Branagh is the star. You know, everybody is still involved, but we are still kind of in the process of, of right now finalizing the script for the pilot. And, you know, once everybody agrees that's in the right place, then hopefully things will start moving forward at a quicker pace. Great, because somebody had asked, uh, Adishri had asked, who would you choose to play the Count? Yeah, you uh, know, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm glad that Branagh is doing it. Uh, you know, so I mean, he could always change his mind in the last minute, I guess, but I'm glad he's doing it. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't, I didn't have really a hard, uh, there's many, many great right actors who could play the part, I think. Yeah. And, and people are saying that they're looking forward to your next book, whenever that is. So, I'm working, I'm working, I, so am I actually. <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. I'm working and, on that now. I will just tell, I'll tell you, it's, it is a novel about uh, three 18 year old boys and an eight year old boy who are on their way from, uh, uh, Nebraska to New York City in 1954 and the whole book is only 10 days so as I said it'll be very different in tone structure in terms of its layers uh, and, and its focus than the, the, the gentleman Mosca. Uh, Nandini had a question that um, which character was the hardest to write and how do you compare rules of civilities writing process to that of uh, a gentleman in Moscow? Hardest character to write. Um, I think in a way it was, uh, I think it was Mishka. You know, he's a tricky, he goes through such radical change in his own life, going from being uh, someone who was in favor of the revolution, kind of from a background. I think of Mishka, I don't think it says it in the book, but I've always imagined that he was the illegitimate son of an aristocrat. It's quite common in Europe where if you're an illeg illegitimate son, you kind of had, you got half the cake, you know, you, you, you were, you probably went to a better school than if you were, uh, you know, a, a common person, you were treated better in society than if you were a common person, you got a little bit more money, uh, but not all, but you didn't have all of it, you didn't have the title, you didn't have the full respect, you didn't have the, you didn't, you know, necessarily inherit. Um, and so, so Mishka is sort of that kind of figure. So he's grown up with a count, but uh, kind of one step below him in terms of stature. Um, and, and he embraces the revolution. He thinks it's a great idea, as, as many you know, intellectual uh, Russian uh, aristocrats uh, did. Um, there were many, many who were in favor of reforms. Um, and that I knew that he would kind of embrace it, get all excited, and then you know, ultimately become uh, disillusioned and then run afoul in a major way. And, and sort of to, to carry that that personality and that, that the commitment to the revolution and they go through the, the, the disillusionment and then to pay the price leading to a, a, realm, a, a new sort of type of bitterness that 
he'd never had in his life, you know, and to then to witness this by the count, that was, I think, the most uh, challenging of the of the sort of the relationships to describe, you know, um, partly because it comes from their boyhood all the way to you know their older age. Um, uh, so there's that 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 the, the other what was the second half of the question. Oh, I forgot. Or was how or was rules of uh, civilities writing oh, yeah. process different from? Right. Yeah, for those who've read both books, I mean, I, you know, rules of civility is is again very different in tone and structure than a gentleman in Moscow because it's told from the perspective of a 25 year old woman from a working class background who's beginning to climb the social and economic ladder of New York City in 1938, and it's one year in her life. Um, and and I, they're, they're very different books, they're very different people, or they have a very different tenor. Um, I think they have a lot of the same satisfactions. If you like one, you, you, you would probably enjoy the other. Um, but the, the, the key element for both in, in, in creating them is tone of voice. You know, I, I don't think either book works um, if, you, if I can't get the right tone of voice for the main character you know, how they think, um, and, and because it's that tone of voice that really, that sets, that creates the, the idiosyncratic element of the story, you know, that makes us uh, understand the person, become attached to them, and we get to see the world through a different perspective. Um, and the Counts and uh, Katie's perspectives are very different. They, they provide me the pleasure of seeing the world in different ways. Um, but if you don't get that tone right early, the whole book can kind of just fall apart. Uh, someone uh, is asking you that uh, do you intend writing sort of like a spin-off from uh, Sophia's perspective? Uh, I don't think I'm writing any spin-offs. I'm sorry. I, mean, I leave the I leave the future of the characters in your capable hands. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great uh, thing to do, really, because uh, you know there's so much then that leaves it to the reader to think and and yes. and, and, and you know ponder over in a way. Because even towards the end of the book, I don't want to give it away, and I'm not going to. Though I'm so, so, uh, I'm like almost eager to ask you the question, but I will not. It's about the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> no, I won't. Uh, but, you know, it just leaves so much. And, and you know, in a way, you, uh, most of the time, you, you know what's happening and then you understand it. And yet there's something that you just want it to be. You know, you don't yeah. want everything to be spelled out anyway. Yeah. And um, there's Mona Raza who says that she's corresponded with you over email earlier this year. And uh, she says, is there any character that is based wholly on a single person? No, not, not in, in either book, really. Uh, I don't, I kind of, I invent the characters based on kind of who they need to be. And they're not really tied to uh, uh, a person that I know. So I think that's about it. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Amor. My, uh, my Go ahead. Sorry. I, think, I think that's it. Yeah, sorry. And I just want to say that, uh, like I said, you know, this book uh, has moved so many people. I mean, I, I don't think you can imagine the number or the count, right? I mean, uh, the, the, uh, and it's just extremely, extremely overwhelming to read this. It's beautiful in the sense that, you know, there's so much that, that you have, you, you, the very poetry of your writing, um, uh, you know, it, it hits you because it's so relatable. When you speak of friendship, when you speak of love, when you speak of what could have been, and then you speak of a, a totally different environment outside of the hotel then, and then to compare and sort of contrast the two. You speak of accidents that take place in the hotel, uh, and so much more when, when phones start ringing at the same time. And I had this big grin on my face, and there was so much excitement uh, in the last 50 pages. And there's so much in this book that, I, of course, it, it, it there will be a reread very soon. And I'm sure a lot of people will reread, even if they know the end and, and they know the, and they know everything. But thank you so much for writing this book for readers. And I mean, it's, 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 been, it's been beautiful. And thank you very much for joining me in this conversation, Amor. And thanks a lot. Uh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Uh, are you on mute? There we go. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No. So thank you very much for thank this. Thank you for all that. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, um, and uh, I hope to read your next book very soon.
And yeah, me too. All the, all the very best for the writing. And you thank take you care. All for, thank you all for joining me today. And thank you, Vivek, for setting it up. Thank you, Amor. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.